Cool. Um, hi, my name is Alexei. I'm a PhD student at the Imperial College in London and a researcher at SP Research. And today I'll be talking about Xclaim, a new approach towards blockchain interoperability with cryptocurrency backed assets. Now, this is joint work with people from the Imperial College Lab for Cryptocurrency Research and Engineering, and Dominic is here in the audience as well. So the motivation behind this research is quite simple. There exist over 2,000 cryptocurrencies which differ in design and purpose. And what we would like to achieve is trustless and scalable cross-chain communication. Now, I think we can all agree to some extent that the history of theft and loss that we've seen in cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin is mostly related to centralized providers. And as a counter movement recently, so-called decentralized exchanges have appeared. Now, while I should not discuss their security and trust assumptions, what we do know is that they account for a very small fraction of the overall volume and they don't operate cross-chain. So most of these systems actually only offer trades on the ERC of ERC-20 tokens on Ethereum. Now, atomic cross-chain swaps using hash time lock contracts has been, have been around since 2012. And we've heard about how HTLCs work, but the challenges that we have here is that both users or all users who interact in the swap must be online throughout the entire trading protocol. And they must monitor all blockchains throughout the entire trading protocol as well. Furthermore, they must establish out-of-bound channels before each swap because they need to exchange so-called revocation transactions. Without these revocation transactions, funds could be lost and locked up indefinitely if one of the two parties crashes at the wrong time. And another more usable aspect of this is that we don't really have a standard for HTLC contracts. Even in Bitcoin, there are different ways that we could construct the scripts. And across blockchains, it makes it quite difficult for developers and applications to seamlessly integrate them. Now, cryptocurrency-backed assets follow a quite simple idea. What we want to do is we lock up some coins in blockchain A, or in Bitcoin, as we use in this example, and we create a one-to-one -one representation on another blockchain, for example, on Ethereum. That means we create one-to-one -one backed Bitcoin tokens on Ethereum. Now, the idea is that once you have these Bitcoin backed tokens on Ethereum, you can use them just like the native asset. That means we can actually use them in decentralized exchanges, making them cross-chain. We can use them in payment channels, as we've heard today, making them operate cross-chain. And we can use them to build more potent atomic swap constructions or stuff like stable coins. Now, once we're finished with these features, we want to go back to the Bitcoin side. And for this, we destroy the tokens and receive the Bitcoin. Now, the question that probably most of you are asking is, how do we achieve that the Bitcoin are released only when the tokens are destroyed in Ethereum? And this is indeed a problem because Bitcoin is not aware of any events that happen on the Ethereum side. So the th first thing that comes to our mind is, well, could we use hash time like contracts, the main tool used in Bitcoin script? And unfortunately, no, because Either we would have to create and store secrets in the smart contract, which is not possible in a permissionless setting, not yet at least. And the other problem is that in HGLCs, we need to know upfront who will be the person who receives the coins from this lock, which is not really usable in our scenario because if I create an asset, which is backed, I want to trade it to anyone. I don't know upfront who will receive it in the end. So we need some kind of intermediary on Bitcoin. And obviously this intermediary should be trustless. So if you look at the system model, and I'll skip through the main act, the simple actors here, we have two intermediaries. We have the vault, which is responsible for locking and holding the Bitcoin on the Bitcoin side and then redeeming them to the user once called for, and a smart contract, which ensures that the vault behaves correctly. Specifically, the vault is collateralized in the smart contract and must prove correct behavior to it. Now, if you look at the smart contract, we see that quite a lot of stuff is going on there, and I recommend you to look at the paper I won't have time to go through all the details right now, but one thing that we'd like to highlight is the chain relay. Specifically, for those of you who are not familiar with the terminology, the chain, a chain relay can be seen as a cross-chain SPV or light client. As such, it allows us to verify events and agreement on a state across blockchains. On the example of Bitcoin and Ethereum, this means that we can check that a transaction was indeed included in the Bitcoin blockchain and have this as an event trigger on the Ethereum side. On the high level, it operates just like an SPV client. We store the block headers, and then a user can submit the transaction inclusion proof, specifically the hash of the transaction and the path to this transaction um, in the Merkle tree of the block. Now, before we come to the protocols, let's talk about the system requirements. So we've heard that we need smart contracts on the issuing blockchain because we need to have chain relays, we need to have collateralization, and we need to have on-chain assets like tokens. However, one thing that we try to achieve is that we do not have any requirements for the backing blockchain. 
Essentially, the only thing that we need to be able to do is transfer assets between users. And this we will, in theory, support any blockchain. We support Bitcoin, Litecoin, and so on. Obviously, should we have smart contracts on both sides, this makes things easier and we can automate and optimize the process. Uh, and more details on this in the paper. Now, let's talk about the protocols. So as mentioned, the first thing that happens is that the vault, and this can be any user, we make no restriction to this, must lock up collateral in the Ethereum smart contract. And this collateral also defines how many Bitcoin backed tokens can be issued with this vault. Now again, I use Bitcoin Ethereum as example for for simplicity, but again, we support different blockchains. Now, what will happen next is that Alice, who has Bitcoin and wants to issue Bitcoin back tokens, will send Bitcoin to the vault. And then she will instantly submit a proof to the smart contract, to the chain relay, showing that this transaction has been included in the Bitcoin main chain. Obviously, you should wait for the confirmation and the security parameters to apply. Now, the chain relay will verify this and confirm to our smart contract that the lock has been executed correctly, and the smart contract will release the tokens to Alice. Now, what we do notice here is that the vault can be offline throughout this entire process. Even more, it cannot prevent Alice from issuing these tokens. Once the collateral is locked, the vault has no influence about who will be using the system. There is, however, one problem. Alice should only issue the tokens if the collateral is there. But this can, their pro this can lead to a problem with race conditions. Specifically, two users or more users can try to issue at the same time for the same amount of collateral, and only one of them will have their assets secured. And the other problem is that the vault could try to withdraw collateral before Alice or anyone else finishes the process and submits the proof. And this can be due to latency issues, synchronization of two chains, or denial of service attacks. So we introduced two simple but quite effective mechanisms. The first is straightforward. We forbid the vault to withdraw collaterals instantly, but we have a delay phase where the contract waits for ongoing issue processes to be finalized. And secondly, we use collateralist issue commitments. Specifically, before sending coins to the vault, Alice registers a commitment to, issue the, to initiate the issue process in the smart contract. And this temporarily blocks the necessary collateral of the vault and allows Alice to proceed with the issue process. Now, obviously, Alice, as a malicious person, she could try to grief the system by continuously locking up collateral. So this way, to prevent this, we require some minimum amount of collateral to be provided by Alice, which will be slashed if she does not finalize the issue process. Now, the trading and the features are, in principle, outside of the XCOM protocol. You can do anything with these assets as if they were native tokens on, the, on Ethereum, for example. Now, let's assume Bob received some Bitcoin back tokens and would like to go back to Bitcoin. So for this, he locks these tokens in the, Bitcoin, uh, sorry, in the smart contract, and the smart contract issues an event. And this is the first time when the vault has to come online and do something, because the vault observes this event and proceeds to release the Bitcoin to Bob. And then, to finish the protocol correctly, the vault submits a proof that it behaved correctly to the chain relay. And the chain relay will then verify this, and only then the contract will release the collateral to the vault. If the vault goes offline or misbehaves, Bob will be reimbursed for this value, for his loss in Ether. So essentially what happens is, in the worst case, Bob just gets back the Ether instead of the Bitcoin. But the question you may ask yourself, well, what about exchange rates? Because this is kind of a problem here. So what we need to do is we need to find ways how to mitigate exchange rate fluctuations. And I'll skip over this, but we have three main points that we use. We've, we use over-collateralization and a layered collateral adjustment mechanism, where the vaults to behave correctly, they, over long time, they can adjust the collateral and to make sure that the system operates correctly. Um, for a short-term fluctuation, the over-collateralization does protect us. And finally, we have a feature called li automatic liquidation, which can be opt-in, opt-out. But essentially what happens is that should the collateral rate of the vault fall too low or too close to the moment when, from game theoretic perspective, it no longer makes sense to behave correctly, the contract will trigger the redeem process. And um, essentially what will happen then, if this is, for example, done 5% over the threshold, that users will just have a beneficial exchange of Bitcoin versus Ether, and then they can use this Ether to buy Bitcoin later again. Now, the triggering of this can be implemented in different manners, but in the worst case, it requires one single transaction by an honest user or a watchtower to trigger the liquidation process. Now, to highlight the system properties of, our syst um, of this, um, I think the most important three are consistency. That is, we ensure that Bitcoin-backed tokens or cryptocurrency-backed assets are only created if the corresponding proof is submitted. We guarantee that users will either receive 
for example, Bitcoin, all be reimbursed in Ether, and we have the property of liveness. Essentially, you don't need anyone else to create a Bitcoin back token except yourself. You can register as a vault, you can be the person who issues the process, and it's a zero sum game, so it makes no sense to try to collude among parties. Yeah. And another interesting feature is that we achieve scale out. That means the more collateral is locked up, the more vaults participate, the more Bitcoin back tokens or cryptocurrency back assets we can issue in the system. Now, we implement Xclaim on Ethereum and Solidity and deploy it on the Robson test network. Um, we initially used the BTC Relay Serpent implementation, which is by now quite deprecated. It's not very efficient. So we have a newer implementation as well. And the costs that are in the slides are actually even cheaper by now. So yeah, the co code is also open source, so you can check it out on GitHub. And so as we can see, um, at the time of writing, it costs approximately one US dollar, slightly more, to issue an arbitrary amount of Bitcoin back tokens on Ethereum, perform a swap, and then redeem these tokens back for Bitcoin. And we can see also from performance and from the duration of the protocol, the, most, the largest bottleneck is actually Bitcoin and the confirmation rates we need there. Now, to put this into perspective to traditional atomic swaps, we implement H2C swaps between Bitcoin and Ethereum and compare performance and, and, and cost to our protocol. And Xclaim outperforms H2C swaps after the second swap. And the reason is that in H2C swaps, you have to establish the channel up front, you have to do the synchronization between two blockchains, and this happens on chain. And you do this process for each swap each time. It's memoryless. In Xclaim, we do this process once in the beginning, and then you can trade the created tokens on, as, as if they were a native asset. And you obviously can put the native asset off chain as well if you use payment channels. And this is why Xclaim for 1,000 swaps is 96% faster and 65% cheaper than traditional H2C swaps. Now, I do have a bit of time, so let's talk about the challenges in ongoing work. So one thing is that we need to find out how to make chain relays more efficient. At the moment, it will cost us between five and $10,000, depending on the price fluctuations and the amount of um, transactions we need to prove per year to maintain the chain relay. Now, this may seem a lot for a company. This is actually not really much of a lot of money, but still, we would like to reduce the costs. And for this, we can use techniques like Nipo Pals, as we've heard today, or Fly Clients, which try to probabilistically reduce the, blocks, the amount of blocks that you need to submit to the chain relay. And we were looking into other techniques at the moment. And yeah, we're, so basically we can reduce the costs for the verification significantly, despite them already being quite low. Now, another thing is that we'd obviously like to reduce the on-chain broadcast during of our protocol, and we can try to put this whole thing off-chain using payment channels. So we're shortly, actually, nearly, we're nearly finishing a protocol where we can do the whole process off-chain, which reduces costs further. And then Dominic is also working on incentives for the fee market of vaults, because obviously you need to incentivize correct behavior of the participants, and you need to create a fee market for people to be willingly holding um, Bitcoin back tokens and potentially could also have different roles, right? It's, you can have the vault who just acts as an intermediary and other people who offer the Bitcoin back tokens as service providers. And finally, one major issue that we do have are decentralized exchange rate oracles. At the moment, we would have to query or aggregate the exchange rate from different centralized providers. Now, one thing that I do want to mention since I have time is that if sufficient people use Xclaim for, and create Bitcoin back tokens on Ethereum and then trade them on the Ethereum platform, each trade is registered on the blockchain, even in decentralized exchanges. And this allows us to extract some additional information on the exchange rate. Specifically, we see, on the, we see the exchange rate that people agreed upon, which kind of can help us um, to estimate and to double check whether the exchanges that are fed by centralized providers into the contract are actually correct. In the long term, we, can, we could even claim that Xclaim could bootstrap its own Oracle service if sufficient people actually use the system. So yeah, thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. We have a website with a summary and code is online. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi. Um, earlier, I asked a question related to taxes. So my question here is similar. Um, if I am acting as a vault and I'm holding this currency, but I can't use it, uh, I'm not sure how that would affect my taxes. If I would somehow have to explain, like I don't actually, I didn't actually gain any money. And in the same way, if I understand correctly, um, when you convert it from Bitcoin to Ethereum, 
you locked up the Bitcoin, so you lost access to it, but it's still arguably yours. Uh, and then you gain an, a, the, an equal amount of Ethereum. So I, I'm worried that the IRS is going to say, ah, you have twice as much money, pay us the taxes. Uh, can you explain how, how taxes might relate to, to these vaults? So the thing is, as previously mentioned, you don't get Ethereum, in fact. You just get the one-to-one -one representation of a Bitcoin. So you don't create new value. So I don't, see, I don't see that you actually are gaining anything as a user from creating a Bitcoin back token in, in value. The exchange rate should be the same. You, you get one token is one Bitcoin. As a vault who holds these Bitcoins, well, but you can prove that they're not yours. I mean, essentially, if you misbehave, you, you, you steal the Bitcoin, but you lose all your Ether, and you actually will make a loss. I'm not a tax, ex tax expert, so it's hard for me to argue how the IRA will, will, will see this, but essentially, you could argue that misbehaving and trying to make a profit from stealing the Bitcoin that are not yours will actually lead to you losing money. How this applies to the taxation, I cannot say. Uh, are there more questions before we have lunch? Okay, so I, I'm curious about how this relates to the talk on sidechains. I, mean, I, I recognize that you were probably preparing for your talk, but if you have some take on it, I would be curious to, to learn about it. Um. I guess it's best to, to chat offline with me and Denise's afterwards to see how these things compare. But essentially, so the sidechains paper has a mechanism for proof of stake. In this case, we try to make this as generic as possible and to say, well, we don't have any requirements for smart contracts in the backing blockchain, and we try to support Bitcoin as it's one of the largest cryptocurrencies out there. But yeah, the, the ideas and the core thing behind these principles is similar. The terms are different, and I guess the use case is slightly different as well in the motivation. But yeah, well, I guess we're both happy to chat afterwards and compare. One more question, maybe. No question, everybody's hungry. Then thank you very much again.